good after or good morning, actually, uh, everyone. My name is Odo Horn. I'm the president of the North Georgia Conference. That is, I want to welcome to the session called Optic in Ethiopian Christianity. We have started here from the Center for Early African Christianity, which is founded by Dr. Tom. And so we have several representatives that include Joel Olowski, who is a professor at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. We also have Michael Glurup, who, who is research associate at, at the McMillan Center, correct, at Yale University. And both Michael and Joel are part of the Center for Early African Christianity. And then we have Tadebu Sembetu, correct? That's right. And he is a student at Portia Seminary in St. Louis. And they're going to be talking to us about Optic and Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity. So I'm going to ask them several questions. And uh, we will get started on this. Um, first, I want to start with Michael. I want you to tell me about the Center for Early African Christianity and the work of its founder, Dr. S Dr. Thomas Oden. Sure, yes, um, I'm happy to be here today uh, representing the Center for Early African Christianity. We are now based in New Haven, Connecticut. We're about three blocks from Yale Divinity School. And um, we've been here for four years. The, the house is officially known as the Thomas Oden Institute for Classical Christianity and um, informally known as the Odin House. And we um, have our library collection here that we use to uh, put together the ancient Christian commentary on scripture and also our work on Africa. And so we have this as a, a center for uh, people to study and to come to, to do some research using the Divinity School libraries and our own personal library. Um, just kind of give you, a, so we were founded in 2007 the mission of the CAC is to encourage and promote the study of early African Christianity. And we do this not only through the production of books and articles, we do it also through uh, research seminars, uh, work in Africa, also kind of a certificate program that's online and uh, distance, uh, distance learning. We also support centers like the Andrew Walls Center for Early African Christianity in Ghana, and then also the new uh, center in Ethiopia at the Ethiopian Graduate School of Theology. Thank you, Michael. And, to, and tell me, I'm, I'm going to make sure I got it correct. You're a research associate at Yale University? Yes. Yeah, so I, at Yale, I run a program uh, that I, I started with um, Professor Lamansani. And so it's called the Religious Freedom and Society in Africa program. And so we promote um, understandings of civil society, how religion contributes to the formation of civil society and the morals of uh, different communities. And we also look at the fact of the importance of religious freedom as part of being part of that civil society. So we do quite a bit of work in Islam, Muslim communities in Africa, and also in Christian communities. And we bring those together. And so right now we, we're doing a series with the Sani Institute in Ghana on religion and society in Africa. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Laman Sane uh, a little bit later, but I want to introduce Dr. Joel Olowski. Uh, Dr. Olowski has his PhD from Drew University, an ordained Lutheran pastor who currently serves as a professor of historical theology uh, at St. Uh, Concordia Seminary in St. Uh, Louis, Missouri. Dr. Olowski, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, sure. I, I worked with Mike on the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture when I was at Drew, so I spent about 10 years there. And, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we, um, we decided as we were working through the commentary is that we looked at, you know, how, um, many of these commentators on, early Af on Christianity were actually from Africa. So back in 2007, as Mike noted, we started the center, but we had... Um, kind of an introductory meeting that we had in Addis Ababa. And we were able to uh, talk with, well, uh, what was it, 30, I think, different African scholars and pastors and teachers from Africa. Um, 
just about this, this discovery you know, that Africa had really um, been very determinative in shaping the Christian mind as we, uh, as we discovered in this commentary tradition. So <clears throat> one of the questions I decided to ask at that, um, that opening session was, you know, well, first of all, if they understood the thesis and then secondly, if they really needed us to be involved in this uh, research, which was quite interesting because they actually did want to partner with us in this and we um, were able to then kind of take the next well, 10, 15 years here to just kind of um, explore these, uh, well, explore these resources that we have for the African church, but also, you know, for the uh, worldwide church. So it was, um, was quite an interesting discovery that I've, uh, I've been happy to be a part of. So I've been teaching here at Concordia Seminary since uh, 2014. I um, previously had taught at one of our universities. So, um, but I, uh, you know, I've always been a fellow kind of a researcher at the, at the center. So even as I teach full-time at Concordia, I like to keep my hand kind of in the uh, African studies part of it too. So, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. And we also have Tebebu Sembetu. Tebebu, tell us about yourself. Thank you very tell much. Us where you're from and tell, tell us where you're from and tell us why you came to Concordia. Yeah, as you said, my name is uh, Tebebu Sembetu. I am an ordained pastor at uh, Makane Jesus. Uh, if you have heard about Makane Jesus, he's one of the largest Lutheran church in, in Africa. And uh, uh, I am ordained and I've been working as a pastor at Adisawa Makane Jesus Church. And uh, I used to teach at Makane Jesus Seminary, uh, which is located in the capital city of uh, Addis Ababa. And uh, I, I am here at uh, St. Louis to do my uh, PhD. I have been here for the last four years. And currently I am working on the, my thesis on uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church liturgy and tradition which is really more fascinating for me. And uh, I'm heading to, to work on my dissertation on this particular topic. And uh, I'm very uh, privileged to be here and to study from uh, one of the prestigious uh, Lutheran seminaries, which is a part pa pa partner to our uh, Mechanicus Church back in Ethiopia. And uh, that's all about me. I'm married, I have three children and my family is living with me here. And I got one more year to wrap up my studies at Concordia Seminary. Okay, thank you so much. And um, Tebebu also comes from, not only is he writing his dissertation on the liturgy of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, uh, Tebebu comes out of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church as well. And so we, he is going to bring us a, a personal experience to the research that uh, we have for you today. So we talked a little bit, tell me, a we talked a little bit about the Center for Early African Christianity. Tell me a little bit about Dr. Thomas Oden and Dr. Laman Sane. Sure. Um, so as Joel mentioned, um, so we were both, um, uh, we were the last two students of, Joel, of, of Tom, basically, and we both worked on the ancient Christian commentary on scripture for Started in, I started in 94, Joel did too. Um, and then we probably didn't finish until 2010. But during that time, we actually started another series um, on um, the creed. We did a five volume series and then we started an ancient Christian text series, which I think we're up to 15 or 16 books. So, um, so we've been pretty busy in the meantime uh, doing that. And then at the center itself, we've produced another five or six books on our own. Uh, from Ethiopian Christianity to an atlas, a historical atlas of ancient Christianity. But with Tom, Tom, you know, mm -hmm. we, when we were doing the ancient Christian commentary, you know, daily we were working on this and we really found that we wanted to show the diversity of, of authors throughout this period. But we kept coming back to the importance of these early African writers, how much they really shaped how we read the Bible today. Uh, especially when we think of origin in the Alexandrian tradition and Augustine in the West. Um, both of these had immense impact on how we understand scripture today. And so when Tom was looking at this, he, he actually wanted to write a book on Christianity in Libya and in, in North Africa, but he felt kind of overwhelmed with it. So he came up with a book called How Africa Shaped the Christian Mind, in which he kind of drew kind of a, um, 
a thesis statement of, of saying, this is what I think we will see if we study this, but I'm gonna allow other people to come along with me to maybe do the research for it. So, um, and that was kind of the basis of the Center of Early African Christianity. Yeah, the seven ways to shape the Christian mind. And again, you know, our basic thesis, Tom's basic thesis was that um, Christianity has a much longer expression in Africa, in the South than it has in Europe. From the outset, Christianity was a non-Western, non-European religion with the intellectual movement was, that was from the South to the North. Now, if you read history books today, you, you get this idea that everything, every good idea actually came from the North to the South. But if you look at Christianity, especially for the first five centuries, we see it, the South to North influence. And that's, and that, you know, basic. Now, when we talk about African Christianity, we wanted to be very clear that it's multicultural. You know, there's five, at least five cultural encounters on the African continent with Christianity. Mm -hmm. You have the Punic and the Berber in the North Africa part. You have the Greek uh, in Cyrene. You have the Coptic in Egypt. You have the Nubian in what is now Northern Sudan. And then you also have the Ethiopian, which was mm -hmm. the Gez encounter in the fourth century. Mm -hmm. So there is a, so when we, when we talk about Africa, we're not talking about a monoculture. We're talking about multiple cultural encounters with mm -hmm. the gospel in different languages. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I do, first, let me apologize. My video and audio are not working well together. So periodically I will show my face to you, but uh, I'm going to go with uh, uh, the video off so that you can hear me clearly. Um, Joel, you had the, did you have an opportunity to work with Dr. Lamansane? Uh, yes, I did. Although I will say that it was pretty much, I mean, uh, when we um, would travel around Africa, I think that's most of my um, early encounters with Laman. Um, in fact, his, I think Mike would talk about too, that we, um, we were kind of Laman's first opportunity to come back to Africa. You know, he himself was a, a converted Muslim. And, um, he pretty much, had not though after he um, arrived at Yale, he had not been back in Africa. So we had invited him to this first conference that we had in 2007, um, and it was uh, it was fascinating to be with him in Africa because we would um, travel with him to Uganda, Nigeria, and places like that. And he was like a rock star, I think, in uh, Africa. <laughs> it was it was fun to watch him because, in fact, when we were at Senegal, for instance, they actually play Basana anthem, I think it was, you know, he had, mm. he had those connections, but um, Laman was uh, one of those um, wonderful uh, people that you get to meet once in a lifetime. I mean, uh, his grasp of the African context and the African kind of uh, the Christian Muslim relationships uh, were, um, you know, one of those things that I think both of us benefited from just to see how he was able to navigate kind of both sides of that world. But also recognize, you know, these these chief African uh, theologians like Tertullian and Augustine, who helped, you know, kind of, how should we say, inform the conversation in many ways. So it was um, it was just fun to watch him lecture, and you'd have these huge crowds that would show up, and um, mm -hmm. it was uh, so. <clears throat> so I'll just, I'll just add one thing on Lamin. Lamin's real big insight was in his first book, one of his books called Translation and Message, and that basically Christianity is a translated religion. It's translated not only into the vernacular, but also into the cultural idioms uh, of the community. So actually pre-Christian culture influences how Christianity is received into the, uh, into the body of Christ, as you might say. So, um, and that, this was, it seems, it might seem like a simple insight to people today, but at the time it was really kind of groundbreaking, especially because if you look at Islam, when you speak, when you talk about Christianity and it, or talk about Islam, then what's the name of God? It's always Allah. But for Christianity, the name of God was the local language, was used in the local language. And so, um, so you know, the Christian missionaries were actually kind of at a disadvantage. They would go into these communities and they would ask, they would, Lama would always enjoy telling this story, um, they would ask the local leaders, um, uh, what is your name of God? And they would look at him and they would go, you've come all this way and you don't even know God's name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so that was, and so, but then they would say, 
that God is the father of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a translation. So all those, that translation of, of that culture was brought into this literary language in the translation of the Bible. And that actually began to form these cultures and these written cultures uh, in Africa and around the world. And so, um, so, the, so his whole point too was that Christianity was always a non-European religion um, and that it, it's a mistake to think of it just in terms of European, that there's actually every culture has something to contribute to the, the body of Christ. And if you look at kind of Paul's metaphor of that the church is a building under construction, that building is still being constructed. And it's being constructed with the addition of these other cultures and peoples and languages into the body of Christ. We often talked about uh, Christianity is the most translated religion. You know, it's one of those mm -hmm. things that uh, you know, when you think about it, it just shows the larger body of Christ, which fits right in with our work in early African Christianity. Uh, the fact that we're all together in the body of Christ and um, that it is um, even uh, when you look at the first gospel, which uh, of course the early church taught was Matthew, that it was probably written in Aramaic first and then translated into Greek, you know, and then into Latin and Coptic and all these other languages. So right from the very beginning, it was um, Christ's purpose to have Christianity be translated into these other languages and cultures so that it would be cross-cultural, transcultural, shall we say. And I think that was a a beautiful insight of Lamont that we've uh, benefited from. Yeah. yeah, and one of the things that we encounter is it, it's hard for Westerners to think of their Christianity as translated. Mm -hmm. They think of it as kind of Bible Christianity, the pure Christianity. But mm -hmm. we have to admit that, you know, our understandings, there's traditions and customs that we brought from our previous cultures into Christianity that have shaped it. But it's, it, it, it is a translated version of Christianity. Okay, so I was looking as you were talking for my book, Translating the Message, and I don't have it, but I do have some other books by uh, Dr. Sama and uh, Sane, uh, including Disciples of All Nations, and Whose Religion is Christianity? Uh, so those are two of the references that you might want to check out as it relates to this uh, topic of Christianity in Africa. Let's move on, though. Uh, I want to talk to Tobebe. Tabebu, excuse me. Um, we're going to, uh, well, Tabebu, actually, let's hold on one second. Let's move on to the New Testament. Let's look at the Egyptians and the Ethiopians in the New Testament. And then after we do that, um, I'll come to Tabebu and he'll give us more of a, uh, the history of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Who wants to, but between Joel and Michael, who wants to take uh, the Egyptians? Who wants to take the Ethiopians in the New Testament? Well, Mike, what do you think? <laughs> well, I, I will, I'll, I'll say two things and then Joel can add on to everything that I missed. How's that? <laughs> so, um, okay. you know, I think, I think there's some important kind of, when we read the, the especially the Acts, uh, the book of Acts, we kind of, we block out certain aspects of the African contribution to Christianity. Um, and Joel can talk maybe a little bit about Mark and his background, uh, but, I would just want to mention first Stephen's, Stephen's speech uh, before he was stoned, before he was martyred. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that he, he described Moses as the one who was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there was a sense that it, their self-understanding is that, you know, the wisdom of the Egyptians helped shape how the, the Old Testament was received in, the, um, in Sinai. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and so that that was something that his characteristic is something very distinctive about it. Then we actually look at it, when we get to Acts eight, we see the uh, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. So when we mm -hmm. use the word Ethiopian, what we meant in the Greek version was kind of a burnt face. It was mm -hmm. it was darkness. It, it might not actually coincide with what we call the country of Ethiopia today. It mm -hmm. might actually have been south of Egypt and Nubia. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what some college scholars want to ask. But, you know, this was one of the first references in the New Testament to actual race. Mm -hmm. And what we see here is that we actually see the conversion of an African Christian, an African to Christianity, before mm -hmm. we see uh, 
Christianity uh, uh, reached going beyond the Jewish borders into the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. So we actually see, you know, the first real um, uh, conversion for Peter was actually uh, the Roman Cornelius. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we actually see the gospel going first to Africa before it goes to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But we don't necessarily tell the story that way. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, Joe. Yeah, of course, Mike mentioned Mark. Uh, Mark, um, well, at least from uh, Tom's research, you know, we would looked in this that uh, Mark and perhaps his mother, um, but also others, uh, most likely came from Cyrene, which, you know, when you ask your average Bible study, where is Cyrene? They would just assume it's someplace in Greece, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you actually look at it, um, you realize it's on uh, North African side of things. So mm -hmm. and there was a large uh, Cyrenaic Jewish community there in Jerusalem. In fact, um, you know, I always find it fascinating a couple of things. First of all, that you have somebody like John Mark's mother, who actually is, is probably hosting the Last Supper. You know? So you've mm -hmm. got an African woman, an African family, uh, actually hosting our Lord in one of the most important events uh, you know, of the New Testament, the, the institution of the Lord's Supper. Oh, and there they are, right there in the upper room, um, and she's providing the hospitality for that. Um, uh, you've also got her son there, um, probably at the betrayal of Jesus. Um, he's probably the one who ran away naked, you know, um, but he had seen that. Um, and of course, then you've got, um, you know, who's the last person to show kindness to Jesus? It's uh, Simon of Cyrene, who's carrying his cross there. You know, um, It's that you know, these Africans that are kind of in the background, but are um, very much servants there for our Lord in these um, important ways. So, so then you've got, you know, after uh, you know, the Acts account, you've got um, Mark with Peter, um, who would have been uh, traveling uh, around with him, as well as with Paul. And uh, at least church tradition says that Mark was probably the one who um, ended up there with Peter in Alexandria. There's a, there's a whole tradition uh, we were there in Alexandria where they, um, they kind of show the places where Mark would have been, but also um, uh, the fact that in 62 AD, uh, well, even before that, we should just get to the fact that most of the Coptic church looks at Mark as the, the first Pope of the Coptic church. In fact, mm -hmm. if you go to the cathedral there, you'll see him listed as the first uh, Pope in the whole list of uh, the papacy. So it's um, quite fascinating, but it's also <clears throat> according to church tradition that he probably was martyred there. And they can actually show you the place where he was, um, I mean, it was pretty brutal. They, they talk about drawing and quartering him and um, I mean, it was just a, uh, a terrible way to die, but um, he would have been, you know, one of the first to have, been, have paid uh, with his life for the faith even as he established the church there. So uh, Mark is one of those, and, you know, Tom wrote this book called The African Memory of Mark that kind of chronicles a lot of this. And um, I don't have my library here either, so I don't have the book to present, but um, it would be one of those books that I think you know, Mike's got it there, um, mm -hmm. that I think it would be worthwhile to read just to kind of look at you know, uh, the African memory of Mark, which, um, you know, the African memory is different kind of from our scholarly approach. It kind of looks at, how should we say, in, in including traditions as well as um, texts that we have to kind of talk about Mark's uh, contribution uh, to early Christianity. So it's, um, it's quite a fascinating text that way. Briefly explain to me, uh, to those of us, what is Coptic? Oh, well, Coptic is kind of a, how would you call it? It's, it's a local dialect that has much in common with Greek, but you know, you look at the letters, a lot of them look the same, but there are a few that are different. So it would be, uh, I suppose maybe the best way to talk about it is just like Aramaic is a, a dialect of Hebrew, that Coptic would be a dialect of uh, Greek, but it's, it's very much localized there in, uh, in Egypt that way. And I suppose it would be the kind of national language of the, indigenous population of Greece. Uh, I'm sorry, of uh, Egypt. Does that sound yeah, it, it was the It was the local language of Egypt. You know, it, it was pro some of the root words and would be traced back to the pharaohs. It was kind of a ancient Pharaonic language of the locals. And then it, with, with the arrival of the Greek, 
uh, there was the addition of letters and it became a written language. And actually the Bible was translated into Coptic. So Coptic, I think is just a, a Greek word for Egyptian. Okay. Uh, let's switch to Tabebu. Uh, you grew up in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Tell us a little bit about the, uh, a little bit about the history, and I'm going to limit you because that history is so rich. Uh, a little bit is a long. <laughs> it's it's long. So tell me what you what you know about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and your experience there. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, as you said, I I was born from the Ethiopian Orthodox Church family. And I grew up as an Orthodox. Uh, therefore, I, I see that people uh, misrepresenting this Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Uh, because, you know, whenever you talk about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, you have to first of all uh, see the history before Christianity. Because the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is highly dependent on the religious experience of Ethiopians that existed before Christianity. You know, as, as it was already said, St. Matthew was an apostle and uh, he was a missionary to Ethiopia. And both the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and the Catholic tradition affirms that uh, St. Matthew was a missionary to Ethiopia and he was martyred in the mission field. But what is more surprising to me is not that St. Matthew went to Ethiopia, but what was the compelling reason for St. Matthew to go to Ethiopia? And most mm -hmm. scholars, they don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. and the most compelling reason for St. Matthew, according to the tradition, was the growing number of Black Jewish people in Abyssinia. Abyssinia mm -hmm. is the former name of uh, Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, uh, even before Christianity came to Ethiopia, there was a strong sense of monotheistic belief, which had been already established in the lands of Abyssinia. We can read this from the Kubra Nagas, which is translated as the glory of kings, which is a national epic of uh, Ethiopia and the repository of the most important of Ethiopian national and religious feelings and aspiration. And uh, uh, this uh, scholar, whose name is uh, Edward Androp, he said, the Kubra Nagas is uh, the truest and the most genuine expression of Abyssinian Christianity. Mm. And this book speaks about the history of Queen Magda. We read this history from 1 Kings chapter 10, mm -hmm. who is commonly known as Queen Sheba. And Queen Sheba went to Solomon uh, and uh, she stayed with him for about two or four, uh, two to four months in the 10th BC. And upon her return to Ethiopia, she gave birth to uh, Menelik I, who is the son of King Solomon. Mm -hmm. And King, uh, this uh, uh, Menelik I went back to his father. When he grew up, he went back to his father and he, his, his father asked him to stay with him, but he refused and went back to Ethiopia with the firstborn Jewish people, among whom were some priests included who decided to take with them the Ark of the Covenant to Abyssinia, mm -hmm. which is called the Tabot. And the Tabot is the true Ark of the Covenant, which has been brought to uh, 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 Aksum from Jerusalem. And this transfer of the Ark, the Ark or the Tabot signified that the God of Israel has changed his dwelling place on earth from Jerusalem to Aksum, which is the ecclesiastical and the political capital of Ethiopia. And now Aksum becomes the new Zion. This impression is there, Aksum becoming the new Zion. That's why it becomes the pilgrim center where people from all of the world go to celebrate this annual festival called uh, uh, Tumkat, which was celebrated last week. And people from uh, all over the world, especially from those areas from uh, Greek Orthodox Church and from Russian Orthodox Church, from the Coptic Egyptian Orthodox Church, and even from uh, Indian Orthodox Church, people go to this particular place because 
according to Ethiopia, Aksum is a new Zion, and the Ethiopians are the new chosen people. Therefore, this Tawot is central to the worship of the church in Ethiopia, and the way the Tawot is carried in procession uh, around the Ethiopian churches during annual Christian celebration is like Jewish forms of worship. I may, I may not have time to go through that one. Uh, therefore, mm -hmm. the Judaic tradition has influenced the Ethiopians. Mm -hmm. Even after Christianity became the dominant phase, the forms of Judaism have retained great value. Therefore, with numerous witnesses and documents, the presence of Judaism in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church seems established beyond doubt. And the growth of Black Jews in Ethiopia became the concern of St. Matthew to be a missionary in Ethiopia. Okay. So Christianity is not something carried by Western people later in the fourth or the fifth century. Rather, it has deep roots within the Orthodox Church and within the Jewish religion that is one of the, uh, 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 one of the expression and identity of religion in Africa, specifically in Ethiopia, and also their Ethiopians direct contact with the apostles, especially uh, uh, St. Matthew. And also as it is already expressed about the experience of uh, the Ethiopian in it with Philip the Evangelist. And also we have the, the Ethiopian uh, representatives who went to uh, uh, Jerusalem during the Pentecost in Acts chapter two. We read this fact from John Chrysostom's homily on the Acts of the Apostles that the Ethiopians were present during the Pentecost experience. And later on, we see Jewish immigrants soon extended their influence all over Ethiopia and uh, their civilization became the character expression of the characteristics expression of the Aksumite kingdom one of the four strong kingdom by then. And also we have this, the presence of uh, Christian Red Sea traders who had a vital role for the uh, establishment of uh, Christianity in Ethiopia. I don't know how much time I have. I got more. Uh, uh, oh, no. that's, that's good. That's good. Thank you. That's good. Let me actually uh, turn, uh, this is something that was not on uh, what uh, our agenda today, but let me ask Michael and, and Joel. Um, much of what Tabebu mentioned uh, has been confirmed in various 60 Minutes reports um, on CBS, and they showed some of these, uh, the, the Tim Cott Festival that uh, Tabebu was talking about, they showed it uh, in Lalibela. Talk to me about uh, what's, what did 60 Minutes get right? Uh, and what did 60 Minutes get wrong? Um, and as in relation to that, and either one of you. I'll, I'll let Joel answer this, but I, I would just want to point out is that uh, there was an extra point that, that Adulis, which was the port city of the kingdom of Axum, was on the trade route to India. Mm. And so we, and we know that there was Jewish community, communities in India in the first century, so that that was a natural. So there was a natural kind of trading relationship um, through a duelist, um, and and then to on to India. So um, the, it was part of that wider world of of trade, but also of the Jewish just diaspora. And so um, so and we see that Christianity tends to spread along trade routes, and it tends to spread through the Jewish communities at first. Okay. So, so even though we might not have actual documentation from that period, we know these things to be true, because we, you know, the coin we see the coinage actually change in the fourth century. Mm -hmm. uh, it begins to take on a Christian character in the fourth century in Ethiopia. Um, mm -hmm. So we know for sure then that that was a, a really important period within the Ethiopian Christianity. But before that, we don't necessarily have the the physical e evidence, though we do have documentary evidence. Okay. So Joel can talk about the 60 minutes. Well, then I was going to say the fact too that Ethiopia was often uh, confused with India, you know, and I think it's partly because of those those trade routes. Um, and uh, the, I think most of the history uh, with uh, King Azena in the fourth century is probably when you know you really have the documentary or documented kind of proof of uh, of Christianity in Ethiopia. But um, 
you asked about uh, the 60 Minutes uh, episode, which actually I was a consultant on. So, um, you know, I pretty much, uh, when I look at that, I hope that it's accurate because, uh, you know, they were asking me about details of it and I was asking Tabebu and others that we had together to kind of um, put that put that together. So um, mm -hmm. there was a detail we had to change um, that Scott Pelley, I think he was kind of, um, well, I shouldn't get into that, but it was, um, uh, <laughs> uh, I think it was pretty accurate actually. And um, I like the fact that they were able to, kind of bring in that cultural um, aspect of it. You just get the vibrancy of Christianity there in Ethiopia, but also that very Jewish character that uh, Tvebu is talking about, you know, that, that is, um, that is um, a unique characteristic, I think, of Christianity in Ethiopia that you don't find in any other expression of it to the same degree. So um, I thought it was a pretty good episode, <laughs> you know, in that regard. Let's uh, move on, because uh, I could talk to Tabebu. I've been to Ethiopia several times, and I could talk to Tabebu and you all about Ethiopia. But let's move on to the early African Christianity um, after the disciples, after the apostles. Let's uh, talk, tell, talk to me about uh, St. Athanasius, St. Augustine, uh, any of the Abbas and Amas during that time period whom, according to Dr. Thomas Oden, influence, helped to influence Western Christianity or Christianity in general? I, I could maybe start out with that a bit. Just uh, at least maybe talk a bit about Athanasius. Um, and of course, he was building on, I could mention Origen of Alexandria. I mean, Origen kind of set the stage, shall we say, for much of the uh, interpretation of scripture, but also I think in many ways, also the discussion about the Trinity, because, you know, he did, um, he did talk about the Son and also the Spirit in his, um, his work on the, the first principles, as he called it. So, um, you know, there was, um, shall we say, at least a discussion starting already in the third century, but um, it kind of came to a head there in the fourth century with a bishop, well, not a bishop, a presbyter named Arius, uh, who kind of challenged the, whether or not uh, Christ could be uh, considered equal with the Father. Um, so when you think about probably one of the most seminal doc doctrines of the Christian faith, uh, you know, the, the Trinity, it really um, has its first iterations and discussions on the African continent as it, as it uh, takes place. The council itself, of course, took place in Nicaea, which is in Asia Minor area, but um, you've got the key theologians talking about this, arguing about it. Um, there in Alexandria. So Athanasius was a bishop. He became a bishop at the age of uh, 30. And of course, even that was kind of one of these things that was contested by some of his um, fellow Alexandrians. But um, he was confirmed as bishop in 328 after the Council of Nicaea. And he spent then the rest of his life basically, you know, arguing about the, the divinity of Christ with the Arians. Um, in fact, he uh, he paid a price for that. He was exiled five times. Uh, wow. uh, you know, so uh, some pastors think they have it tough today, but, uh, you know, just try getting sent on extended vacations as he was. Um, but it was, you know, he, he's actually um, received the title kind of, you see, Athanasius Contra Mundum in Latin, um, against yeah. the world. <laughs> so he was a pretty uh, tenacious bishop that way. Um, but at the heart of his tenacity, shall we say, was his defense of uh, Christ you know, and the fact that he was he was fully God and fully equal with the Father. But the question is, well, you know, what's the big deal? Well, when they wrote the creed there in 325, you'll notice they have a key phrase there about Christ, you know, and it's that phrase, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven. And if you had anybody less than God, purchasing your salvation, yeah, being the author of your salvation, Athanasius to do, then your salvation itself was in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. So this is why he was so uh, tenacious uh, in his battles against the Arians. You know, they would even, they even had a warrant out for his arrest, shall we say, at some point, you know, he's, he's going down the Nile River and um, there you got these, um, these uh, soldiers, you know, from the empire looking for him. And now uh, they even ask him, so tradition says, have you seen this guy Athanasius? And it's almost like, yeah, he went that way, you know, <laughs> so he was able to, uh, you know, evade them. Um, but he was, um, let's just put it this way, he was, he was kind of the defender of the faith that um, influenced 
people like we call the Cappadocians who were in other, you know, up in uh, Asia Minor. Um, he influenced uh, people throughout the empire who were trying to talk about what uh, Christ means, you know, in his relationship to the Father. And he, of course, also had a lot to say about the Holy Spirit, too. I mean, he's one of the first to have an extended discussion uh, in these letters uh, to a bishop named Serapion about the divinity of the Holy Spirit, because he understood, you know, as goes the Spirit, so goes the Son. I mean, he even says that, that if the, the Spirit isn't God, then the Son isn't God, and then your salvation's still in jeopardy, and those baptisms that you were baptized with, you know, they're just creature baptisms, so they don't really mean that much unless he's God. So um, Athanasius is, to me, one of the most important figures. I have a class, I teach on it just because I want our Lutheran students to understand just how seminal he is uh, for our Western understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. So maybe I'll just stop there for a second. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give Michael the opportunity to talk uh, as well uh, on Augustine or Athanasius, whomever. Right. So I would just follow up with Athanasius, too, is that, you know, he spent in his exiles, uh, he spent many times, much of his life living in the kind of the remote areas of Egypt, uh, answering the questions of monks and, or answering questions of these communities that dealt with their local issues. Um, and so I think a lot of times we, we think of him as this writer in Greek, um, this intellectual, this bishop, but he also had this pastoral function that really shaped how he, he, he did theology and how he saw the world. And I just want to go back and mention Origen. Origen was actually a third century figure and it's, it's difficult to appreciate the influence that Origen had on how we understand Christianity today. His name was actually, um, he, his name was actually a derivative, of, it was a compound of the Egyptian god Horus. So, and we know that he wasn't a Roman citizen because he wasn't, uh, he wasn't martyred with his father. So that, most, that means most likely that his mother was non-Roman. Uh, mm -hmm. She was probably either Egyptian or Greek. And so, um, that's so we we already know that about him personally that he he wasn't a roman citizen at the time but what he tried to do he was very ambitious intellectually and he tried to bring he he felt like that his hellenistic or greek culture and christianity were fully compatible that mm -hmm. you could bring those two together intellectually in a way that that uh, was a, a perfect union of those two um at the time though his fellow uh, philosophers did not believe that you could actually have a Hellenistic philosophy without polytheism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so in some ways, uh, Andrew Wall says it this way, the Greek academy becomes converted in a process that began in Africa. Mm -hmm. So we actually see the conversion of the Greek academy, the philosophical academy, into Christianity, which began in Africa through the work of people like uh, Origen. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I, so I think you know, I think history would say that Origen went too far. He found too much compatibility, <laughs> and, and and the later Christians said, no, it's it's not that compatible. There are differences, and in some ways, we need to Christianize Greek philosophy more than uh, Hellenize Christianity. And so, uh, but I think that's important just to show because then. Uh, he becomes an important so source for later writers, spe specifically the Cappadocians, uh, Ambrose of Milan, and his kind of allegorical readings of scripture were actually kind of what opened, was part of the opening of Augustine to the truth of Christianity. So even though or Augustine never read uh, any Greek texts, he, he wasn't, he wasn't um, fluent in it, he actually was influenced by people like Origen through the translations and the sermons of Ambrose. Mm -hmm. and it's interesting to, you know, that sometimes when you, you hear these names like Tertullian and Augustine, you know, often people think that these guys were, you know, Roman and lived in Rome. <laughs> you know, I, I was surprised by that, that, um, you know, when we talk about Tertullian, for instance, being an African from Carthage, um, he's the one who gave us the Latin terminology for uh, the Trinity in the West. You know, I mean, he, he talks about the three personae, tres personae, una substantia, you know, the three persons 
one substance. That's, that's the language we uh, still use in the West. And uh, that language came from an African, not from somebody in Rome. Uh, the same thing with Augustine. You know, um, I don't know if you know much about his history, but uh, of course, you know, his mother was a Berber, first of all, Monica. So Berbers come from Africa, right? But um, even just the fact that, uh, you know, his 75 years that he spent here on this earth, only five of them were spent outside of Africa. So, you know, uh, he's definitely a product of uh, Africa in terms of both culture and thought. Um, he, of course, wanted to be the best Roman thinker he could be, but that's because that was kind of the lingua franca of the day, shall we say. But, um, you know, he's, um, Augustine is just, I think almost, you know, we got to look at him as the giant, really, of the early church as far as his influence for the rest of the church. Um, you know, his, his confessions, for instance, um, what a beautiful example of uh, just how his, it's, it's a, um, a work of praise to, to God, frankly, but it's also you know, a very penitential kind of text when he even talks about his own conversion you know, there in the garden when he um, took up the scriptures and as I've say, he played Russian roulette or you know, biblical roulette with the Bible. That's a dangerous thing, you know, see what first passage you come on. Well, he was convicted at that point and the rest is history, shall we say, as far as his uh, role in Christianity. But uh, his texts on the Trinity, for instance, 15 books written over 20 years, um, you know, is, is one of those texts that's still influential. And of course, the city of God that he writes, right? Towards the end of his life, when he's looking at, um, you know, kind of the barbarians uh, at the gates, literally, you know, and this is his, his kind of uh, foray into that, uh, the two cities, you, know, you have the city of God and the city here on earth. And um, ultimately we have dual citizenship, but that dual citizenship is leading ultimately to our citizenship in heaven. I mean, Augustine is just a, a treasure from Africa that is a gift that keeps on giving. And so um, it's just one of those, he's one of those figures that I don't think you can ever explore his full contribution, but um, that, that kind of has, we have, you know, he, he is one of the seminal people that we can look at. In, in our field, the, the, the statement is, uh, there's Augustine scholars, and then there's scholars of everyone else. <laughs> because the secondary literature on Augustine is, is so significant. I think, I think it's probably over 80,000 books now. Wow. It, wow. And that doesn't just include his, his authored work. So it's, uh, it's, he's had a, a very important influence on, especially the Western tradition on how we understand Christianity. One of the people that actually had an influence on him was uh, St. Anthony, uh, which, you know, traditionally in textbooks, St. Anthony and Pacomius were considered the founders of um, monasticism, even though now we know that monasticism and th this type of aesthetical behavior was known throughout the, the Mediterranean world. They became very, they became uh, symbols, uh, popularizers of it. And in some ways, St. Anthony was a, a con conversion from kind of a traditional Coptic Christianity into more of a charismatic Christianity. And uh, he moved into the desert and Athanasius recorded his life. And it, it actually was kind of a worldwide bestseller. And it was one of the books that Augustine read uh, before his conversion. And so there was a certain power and, and these, these, Pacomius was kind of a commuting monasticism. Um, Saint, um, yeah, so we have a community mass monasticism, and then with uh, St. Anthony, we have kind of a hermetical or a kind of singular monasticism. So, um, and again, this was, St. Anthony was actually very important in Tom's life, because St. Anthony, Tom went to visit St. Anthony's cave uh, mm -hmm. on the Red Sea, near the Red Sea, and, and he said that was one of the really highlights of his, his kind of uh, personal journey in Christianity, was mm -hmm. seeing that cave and the influence that that one person had on how we understand Christianity today. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you. Really, kind of, um, really became models for European monasticism that really shaped the Middle Ages. Okay, uh, Joel, I'm going to come to you in a second. To Babel, I'm going to come to you next. After Joel, I want you to tell me about Michael the Deacon. Um, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Let me let Joel make his, his comment first. Go ahead, Joel. 
yeah, I'll let two of you talk about Michael the Deacon. I was just simply going to say, if you haven't read The Life of Anthony, it's one of those texts that, you know, uh, spiritual warfare. Uh, I often have my students read it, and it's their first kind of experience of actually dealing with this. So it's, um, it's a fascinating text that can kind of come across strange at first, but it's um, one of those texts that I think everybody should read just for um, kind of spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the references that you guys have provided during, during this. Uh, Tebebu, tell us about Michael the Deacon and his influence on uh, Christianity in Ethiopia. All right. Uh, I think I, I would like to say a little bit about the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church, if you give me time, maybe later on. But now uh, let me talk about Michael the Deacon. This is a, a a deacon who met uh, Dr. Martin Luther. And uh, there is an article produced by uh, Professor David Daniels, who is a professor of world Christianity at uh, Malcomic Theological Seminary. And he's a bishop too. So he said for his, the title says uh, Martin Luther's Dream Church. It is not in Europe or it was not in Europe. He said, in a sense, uh, the Church of Ethiopia was a dream for Luther as a true uh, forerunner for Protestantism. And in fact, Luther had this kind of impression of this Ethiopian Orthodox Church uh, after he met uh, Deacon Michael in the 16th century, and he gets some uh, explanation of Ethiopian Christianity since the fourth century. As, 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 an, as an organized orthodox institution. So Luther said, this church is a, really this nation or Ethiopia is the first nation in history to convert to Christianity and the first Christian kingdom. You know, uh, uh, Christianity became a state religion from uh, early third, third, uh, fourth century until the 20th, late 20th century. So uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church has a direct tie with the apostles. This is what uh, uh, the, the professor uh, said, and conferred legitimacy on reformers emerging Protestant vision of the church outside of the authority of uh, uh, the, the Roman Catholic papacy. And of course, there are so uh, many other reasons why Martin Luther uh, uh, commend the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. As, as a model church and uh, uh, could be seen as a forerunner for the reformation. And one of those uh, 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 reasons is the Ethiopian Orthodox Church maintained both the bread and the wine at communion since the earliest time of its establishment in the fourth century and fully embraced the gospel, the gospel of Christ Jesus and also uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church used vernacular scripture uh, uh, the, as, as it was said, it's the first, uh, uh, the earliest translation of the, the Bible in Greece, a Semitic language, which is also still a liturgical language, both in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and also in the Eritrean Orthodox Church. And also the Ethiopian Orthodox Church has rejected uh, uh, the, 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 the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church on the uh, indulgency and purgatory and also rejected marriage as sacrament. And uh, uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church uh, has uh, uh, a married clergy even now since its beginning. So pointing all these points uh, this professor said, we need to commend the Ethiopian Orthodox Church because we can see uh, how this church become a kind of a forerunner for the reformation. And uh, even Martin Luther himself has proved this, this reality. Therefore, as I said earlier, the expression of Judaism in Christianity in Ethiopia is an example of uh, a unique interpretation of Judaism and Christianity, which is unknown anywhere in the West and which is really very peculiar to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. That's why uh, other African countries see the Ethiopian Orthodox Church as a model church 
such as uh, South Africa and Kenya and others, because this is the first indigenized uh, African church, which, uh, and also Ethiopia is a non-colonized country, as you know. So mm -hmm. Ethiopian Christianity is an exciting example of non-Hellenized Christianity, as well as uh, a manifestation mm -hmm. of uh, peculiar Jewish origin of religious assimilation that is adapted in the context of Christianity. Uh, and the Ethiopian uh, Christianity is not primitive or useless duplication of Judaism as some represent it that way. Rather, it is a unique expression of uh, non-Hellenized Christianity, which must be understood in its own context and, and uh, tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what, uh, and the history of Ethiopian Orthodox Church offers uh, a look at African Christianity that has existed uh, for early, as long as uh, it's, it's, it's a time uh, of establishment. Uh, just a, a side note, I would just say that uh, we actually sponsored that conference of David Daniels here at the Center for Early African Christianity. Oh, great. So we had a group of five or six scholars come in here and discuss kind of the Ethiopian African influence on the Reformation. So let's go, uh, go with that uh, because we want to talk about Martin Luther, we want to talk about John Wesley, any of the reformers that may have looked to the Coptic church or the Ethiopian Orthodox church as the model uh, when they decided, hey, the Catholic church is not um, the model we want to follow any longer. And I'll direct that uh, right, because Tobebu gave us some, some good information with Michael the, uh, the deacon. Uh, what well, Michael and Joel, what do you have to add? Well, um, I think I'd love to point out the fact that Lutherans, you know, we're, we're going back to Africa now, you know, and we can look to the Ethiopian churches. Uh, the Ethiopian Lutheran church is one of the biggest churches. I mean, it's, it's kind of an ironic thing, but also um, another thing to rejoice in. I mean, Luther, you know, um, not just even just in terms of Coptic, shall we say, but just think about Luther's background. I mean, what, did, what was he before he uh, kind of had his breakthrough? He was an Augustinian monk. You know, so he was really, uh, you know, he was trained by an African on how to read scripture. I mean, uh, Luther's earliest forays into theology were actually uh, on how to interpret scripture. If you look at his earliest writings, his first writings are actually on the Psalms. Uh, it's called the Dictata Supersalmus in Latin. Um, so it was kind of, he was, he would have learned that from Augustine, which of course Augustine's biggest commentary is on the Psalms. You know, he's, he's got I don't know how many volumes is that, six, seven volumes on the Psalms. Um, so Luther himself was shaped and formed by an African uh, in the terms of Augustine, in terms both of how to read scripture, but also even in terms of understanding of grace and things like that too. And, um, and the very heart of justification that, uh, that he talks about. So uh, that's, that's one thing we often forget is that before Luther kind of had his, shall we say, break from Catholicism, he was very much an Augustinian monk who was had those patterns of reading scripture daily uh, centered on the Psalter that uh, as one Augustinian monk told me, he said, you know, really Luther learned how to read scripture from us. You know? And I was like, yeah, you're actually right. Um, so th the fact that you have that kind of seminal development in terms of how he read scripture, um, I suppose the other area where he was very much influenced was by Cyril of Alexandria, who of course is one of the, the how should we say, Coptic church's um, uh, favorite bishops right there, up there with, Ale with Athanasius. <clears throat> and Cyril, of course, uh, was uh, one of the bishops who in the fifth century had a debate with Nestorius about Christology and how Christ can be both human and divine in one person. So. The story has said, you know, I will never worship a three-year-old, uh, and that kind of gets to the heart of it. He also said, uh, Mary was not the mother of God. Well, Cyril, of course, answered that and said, you know, is Jesus, um, is Jesus God? Yes. Well, is Mary the mother of Jesus? Yes. Well, then Mary's the mother of God. Um, but it, it's it's just this whole understanding of, it, especially in our Lutheran tradition and how we um, how we approach Christology. The, that we look to uh, Cyril of Alexandria as, I suppose, almost like our patron saint, if you will, in terms of being able to, to understand who, just who Christ is. Um, and so 
I could get into that theology deeper, I suppose, in a sense, but just to simply focus on the fact that you've got these two Africans, you've got Augustine, you've got Cyril, both of whom are, you know, probably the most deep thinkers in both Eastern and Western Christianity, shall we say, and both of these were key influencers uh, for Luther and for our Lutheran uh, confessions. We have this thing called the, it's called the Catalog of Testimonies. And this is at the end of the Book of Concord, our, our confessional writings. But it's basically just a list of early church fathers that we look to for our theology. And the two chief theologians, well, three, would be Augustine, Athanasius, and Cyril. So there we've got three Africans who are so influential in the life of the church that um, you know, we can rejoice in today, and, um, that we have this wonderful connection today with our brothers and sisters in Ethiopia, to me, is just a gift that way. Mm -hmm. Michael. So, yeah, so with Wesley, um, Wesley really had a, a fondness for third century writers, uh, Clement of Alexandria, Origin of Alexandria, but also Tertullian and Cyprian of Carthage. And they were, Tertullian and Cyprian both wrote in Latin. Um, and they were both from North Africa. And so they were very important to him. It seems to me from, um, I think Ted Campbell has actually uh, wrote an article about the patristic sources for Wesley. I, he seems to indicate that um, Wesley was not that fond of the conversion of Constantine to Christianity. He, th he thought that did bring some problems to Christianity. So if you look at some of his writings, he tends to be focus on people kind of outside the imperial uh, influence. So uh, Ephraim, the Syrian, the Micaeus, uh, homilies. Um, but he also was influenced quite a bit by John Christensen. And Christensen, as we know, had kind of a, a tenuous relationship uh, with the, uh, the powers that be sometimes. And so, um, so I think his writings were very influential on, um, on John Wesley's theology and formation. And I think you actually, I, when I read a biography of Charles, I think they actually translated some of these third century works, especially Tertullian and Cyprian into English so that they could use, be part of the readings of their um, Methodist network. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the monks. I've heard this, this connection between the monks and monasticism in Ireland with Egypt. Right, so, um, so, so, you know, we, We've actually recently made a discovery of a, um, of a, a Bible, a book uh, in Ireland that was made with Egyptian leather, leather and also Egyptian papyrus, but the leather was all that survived um, from that time. So we also see that in the kind of Celtic art of the Irish Bibles, that was in, really shaped probably from their time at, um, at, in Sinai at St. Catherine's. So the St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt uh, was a very influential kind of a, a, a gateway to a, a variety of languages and people. So we know there was Ethiopians there. We know there were Syrians there. We know there was uh, Egyptians uh, speaking Coptic and Greek. And so um, you see some of the techniques that were probably picked up on decorating these manuscripts actually came from probably, uh, probably from that influence of St. Catherine's Monastery. And, and just, you know, just let you know that the oldest illustrated gospel book in the world is actually from Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, it, it's considered one of the first translations in the Gez. It's yeah. called the Garima Gospel Books. And it's, it's loaded, located not too far from Aksum in uh, northern Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And so it predates, um, you know, anything that we have from Europe. So let me do this as the final question. We're, we're telling, we're talking about people um, who have influenced uh, how Africa influenced uh, the Christian mind. But talk to me about the, uh, Dr. Odin in this book talks about, goes beyond just the theology, goes to, and this is the, the, the last question I'll ask, the, the genealogical work. What's to say that these are not Greeks and, and Romans who, who lived in Africa and taught the indigenous population? Well, I think, I mean, that this is one of the questions our African friends ask us too, you know, were these guys really African because they spoke, you know, 
they wrote in Latin, they wrote in Greek. And um, I guess one of my first questions is why does that just have to be Western? You know? <laughs> I mean, uh, these are you know, my friends in uh, China also <laughs> can work in Latin and Greek, you know? Uh, so, um, you know, what is it that makes someone African? Is it the language? Um, you know, I mean, when Odin kind of goes through this, uh, I think the first thing to say is that, um, where did these guys live, first of all? <laughs> you know, uh, they lived on the African continent. They did not spend their time mostly in Rome or, uh, you know, in Greece or places like that. They were on the African continent. Uh, secondly, that they actually, um, many of them, their uh, kind of genealogies you talk about, you know, their parents um, would have been firmly rooted in Africa, even as, of course, they also had, um, you know, extensions in other parts of the empire. Sure, you know, like Augustine's dad was a Roman, um, you know, official and things. Um, but uh, of course, he was married to his mother, who was a Berber, as I mentioned. So, as you uh, you know, think in terms of what makes them African, uh, the first thing Odin would say is that you know they're on the African continent. But secondly, um, you know the the fact that they were a, a lot of their thought patterns and other things that we see evident in people like Origen, Augustine, um, they are expressing. You know, um, in some ways, uh, it wasn't just about whether they were African per se. I mean, they're, they're expressing the Christian faith, uh, of course, and that's universal. So we shouldn't be surprised to see this universal message. Um, but they're able to often, you know, we've got books like David Wilhite, for instance, who will talk about, um, you know, the kind of indigenous roots of some of these, um, these uh, theologians in Africa. So I think you know, there's a lot more studies. T. T. And who talks about uh, Tertullian, the African? You know these books that um will look at kind of some African characteristics about them. But, um, so I think we can we can point to that. But just I mean to me the overall thing is first of all they this is where they lived. They spoke the local languages. They knew them and they had the local cultures there. I mean Augustine, for instance, will talk about his mother Monica still observing the the customs you know from Africa as they're up there in Milan. Um, so these are kind of hints, shall we say, of their you know, roots in Africa, even as they were also, of course, people who influenced the whole, you know, ancient Christian world. So, um, yeah, and right. I, I would just follow up that, you know, we, we understand people have multiple identities. They have mo multiple sources of identities. Um, and that just to say they're just, they are the, who they, what language they speak seems to narrow that down and denies a lot of the different relationships they have. You know, one of the kind of revolutionary aspects of our time is these ancient DNA studies. And what they've shown us is that everybody's from somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? You know, what, what we considered, you know, Romans really weren't Romans. You know, they were probably from Iraq uh, at one point. And so, um, so there's, there's these migration patterns, there's an exchange of ideas and information, there's an exchange of technologies. We know that Egypt had this long history on the Nile um, and it was deep in the Nile country and so it was influenced not only by the Nubian kingdoms um, and we forget, we really even haven't mentioned Nubia, which was a Christian kingdom for almost a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, they had the Bible translated, they used the Greek, Coptic for probably exchange, um, and then Greek for some liturgical, but they also, you know, worked in Old Nubian. So, um, so I think, I think there's just been a way of telling the story that says that well, they can't be Africans because it's written. It's a written language. You know, we hear this quite a bit about Ethiopia. Ethiopia is really not part of Sub-Saharan Africa. They're not really Africans because they have a. They're they're not an oral culture. They're a written culture. And so, um, so I think there's some bias and maybe they're telling the story um there's we're just saying there's options there's ways of seeing these people more than just as part of the roman empire or part of the hellenistic community so i'm going to go around the uh the screen here with final thoughts i'll start with tobebu to go to joel and michael i would ask that you uh, close it any final thoughts that you have on this topic of coptic and ethiopian christianity tobebu yeah, I just want to briefly say about a little bit about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church doctrine on Christology, because that makes her different from any other Christian Orthodox Church and any other Christian group. You know, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church uh, 
accepted the first three major ecumenical councils of the church, the Nicene, in the Constantinople, and the Ephesian, or the council in Ephesus, but rejected the fourth council at Chalcedon. And uh, the church is known as a non-Chalcedonian church. But most of the time, people refer to this church as a monophysite church, which is, which is a, a, a generalization of, or which comes from lack of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church doctrine about Christology. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church is not monophysite, but it is a miaphysite. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference between two. In a monophysite uh, understanding, the, uh, the prefix mono stands for an uh, elemental unity, which the Ethiopian Orthodox Church rejects. That means the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is neither Nestorian nor uh, Eutychian. But the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is a Miaphysite Church, which stands for a composite unity. And the term Tawahedo, you know, when we say Ethiopian Orthodox Church, yes. that's not the right title of the church. The right title of the church is the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahedo Church. Mm -hmm. And the term Tawahedo means made one, which is the best expression for uh, conveying the inseparable unity of the Godhead and the manhood in the person of Christ Jesus. Inseparable unity of the true man and the true God theory is more apparent in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Of course, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, they don't talk about two natures. It's only one nature in Christ. But this one nature in Christ is a unique, divine, and human one. Mm -hmm. And this term Orthodox best expresses what the Ethiopian Orthodox Church believe about Christology. And the two natures without mixing, without separating, and without confusion. And that is what it means, Tawahedo. Mm -hmm. And uh, this church has, uh, like, as I said, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is uh, really uh, the oldest independent uh, uh, and pre-colonial Christian church in sub-Saharan Africa with more than 50 million members, which makes it the uh, largest of all Oriental Orthodox churches. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tebe Bujo. Oh, just in terms of final comments, so when I usually would end my lectures in Africa, and it was interesting, often they would ask me to lecture on this topic. They would, the topic would be, you know, is Christianity the white man's religion? And mm -hmm. I was always surprised by that topic, because of course, my visceral reaction is no, you know, but the fact that they have to ask the question says to me that this is an important issue. You know? in terms of that this is how it's perceived. And, uh, I guess what we dedicate our work to at the center is the fact that you know, Christianity is not any race's religion. It is, you know, it's, it's for the world, of course. And um, we rejoice in the fact that he's given um, his gospel to uh, black, white, all different colors. Uh, and so I guess in terms of when I look at our work, I think it's important to, um, when one member of the body of Christ hurts, they all hurt. And so we need to address these issues to show how, oh, how much we've received from Africa, you know, um, both in terms of uh, the early church, but how we're receiving that again today. You know? and that to me is the gift that Africa is that it keeps on giving in terms of both its, its theology, but also it just has a wonderful aspect of the, the Christian life, you know, too, that we've, um, we have benefited from and rejoice in. So I, I, I always finish my lectures by simply saying thank you. you know, thank you to our African brothers and sisters who have given us this wonderful gift and insight for our church. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joel. Michael. Yeah, so, you know, this process has made me rethink how I, I tell the story of Christian history. Uh, most Christian histories are self-referential. They kind of tr trace our own trajectory. Uh, and for the Protestant church, there's, you know, a brief stop in the early church, maybe at the councils, then we go to Augustine, and then the church is saved, um, you know, comes back to the pure Christian message in the 16th century with the reformers. Um, but that was actually at the point that Christianity was its most European expression. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I do think, you know, 
And at that time, to be a Christian was to be a European, to be a European was to be a Christian. And so we've kind of been able, we've, we kind of were convinced that was the true story. And I think what I've learned, uh, you know, especially this spring and over the last 10 years is that Christianity is a, is a much bigger story. Uh, in, in from the, the f first millennium of Christianity, it was translated into multiple languages. It was a multilingual church and a multi-centered, multicultural church and a multi-generational church. And I think that's what Tom always talks about orthodoxy is that it's multicultural and multi-generational. And I think to, to really bring these other cultures and generations into how we see ourselves and how we describe ourselves is really important as a church moves forward. Um, one of the things that I learned as an early Christian was that how I see myself is how other people see me. When I look into their face, I say their reflection. And if I'm reflecting back to the world church that you're really kind of second-class citizens because you're not European, then I need to really rethink that. And, and I think we've done that with our African, brother, African American brothers and sisters too. We really have to think about what we're saying when we tell our story. Does our story include everyone? And if it doesn't, then we probably need to, to rethink that. So I wanna thank you uh, to Bebu Simbetu, who is a, a PhD student at Concordia Seminary and also a pastor of Maikana Yesus Church in, in Addis, correct? Addis Ababa? That's right. Okay, Dr. Joel Olowski is a professor at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis and um, Dr. Michael Glurp, Glurp correct? Glurp, yes. Glurp, uh, and he is a research associate and he's, he's also the, um, the executive director, correct, of the, uh, so to first, let's close this. How can people get in contact with this research for the Center of Early African Christianity? How are they gonna get in touch with you? And uh, if anybody wants to do research, at the Institute for Classical Christian um, Studies. How can they contact you? Um, so the, the best way is just to contact me at info at odenhouse.com. And, um, you know, we, we're here and we do have a web page that we're updating it. So it's, it's, it's not in very good shape right at the moment, but there's information on there. Uh, uh, but please feel free to contact me here at the Odin House. Uh, and we're here in um, New Haven. We do have rooms that we uh, have for scholars to come and stay and do research. Um, you know, the pandemic is quite, a, it's made it, us very quiet right now, uh, but uh, we, we do hope to see in the future more people staying here. Well, the United States. I was also gonna mention a website, uh, earlyafricanchristianity.com. Uh, yes, yeah, so yeah, and then again, it's under construction again, so uh, it's doing a refresh, but yeah, that has a lot of good information on it, um, much of what we've discussed here today. Thank you so much, and the United Methodist Men, thank you for this uh, interesting discussion on Coptic and Ethiopian Christianity. Thank you again, gentlemen. Thank you.